In this video, you'll learn how you can unlock the full potential of service design by avoiding the pitfalls of a copy and paste approach to the practice. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm JJ. This is Service Design Show, episode 174. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden and invisible things that make all the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Jung Jolie, also known as JJ. JJ has a long and rich history in service design, going all the way back to her PhD in 2012 at the Aalto University in Finland. Today, JJ is the deputy head at the National University of Singapore in the division of industrial design. Exploring what's beneath the surface of service design. That's what this show is all about. And I've been saying that for a very long time. And in this conversation with JJ, we're going to live up to that saying more than ever. JJ is in a pretty unique position. She has seen firsthand how service design is thought and practiced in Europe. And now being in Singapore, she has an up close perspective on how service design is practiced in Asia. And she sees that People in Asia are, for lack of a better word, adopting the Western approach to service design. But as you might have guessed, this type of adoption doesn't come without any challenges. It's relatively easy to copy the surface layer of service design, the artifacts, the workshops, the story of the double diamond. But it's much harder to grasp the underlying dynamics, to understand and see and recognize the invisible value that's being created to know when you should deviate from the standard process. And this surface layer approach to service design causes problems because despite all the work that you're doing and the outputs that you're creating, it's probably not making a lot of impact. So unsurprisingly, clients start to doubt if this service design thing works at all. Now, although our conversation focuses on the cultural differences between continents and countries, the same lessons just as easily apply on a much smaller scale. Every company has its own unique culture. So what does that mean for how you practice service design? So if you stick around for the entire conversation, you'll hear how you can adapt service design to better fit your culture how you can encourage clients to look beyond the short-term deliverables and why you need to ditch the double diamond sooner than later. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure you subscribe to the channel and don't miss any of the future conversations. That about wraps it up for the intro. So now it's time to jump into the conversation with JJ. Welcome to the show, JJ. Hi, happy to be here. Hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Hi. Awesome to have you on uh, the show. We've never met personally, but we've had some online encounters before. I'm always excited to have people uh, from Asia uh, because it's really hard for me to sort of explore the service design community there. And I think you are a great uh, person to help us understand a little bit more as well us in Europe and Americas, <laughs> what's happening uh, around service design in Asia. We'll dive into that uh, in a second. But before we do that, uh, could you maybe give a brief introduction into who you are and what you do these days? Because I think that's going to be very relevant. Mm, yeah, sure. Um, my name is JJ. Uh, now I'm uh, doing the research and the teaching on service design here in National University of Singapore. And I'm also a director of Service Design Lab Singapore, which I established as a um, collaborative platform to work with uh, various organizations from the public sector, private companies, and also social sector uh, to promote service and capabilities and to help them uh, to uh, do the 
uh, the Shima Center Service Development and Innovation, and also help them to embed design capability within their organizations. So I've been working with uh, various government agencies, uh, the ministries in Singapore, um, and there's the private companies. And um, so what I've been doing was um, I've learned all these notions and practices of service design and co-design. My service design work uh, builds on the empathic design and co-design, which I learned from Finland. So I'm trying to bring those notions and practices in the context of Asia and doing the different experiments with different people. So um, yeah, so here I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are um, somehow linked to episode 169. Oh, and uh, the name, help me, help me with the name. Your yes, from yes, Hello? exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, we talked about uh, CX governance, and uh, she uh, she definitely uh, recommended that I reach out to you. And I think you you collaborated in uh, Finland together. Yes, yes. Uh, Finland, Helsinki, the Art University is where we actually started the PhD study together. So since then, the, it was uh, back in two thousand seven. So for like five, six years, we've been doing many exciting projects on co-design, the service design with um, different people. So that's, I think, how I kind of got the very first the training and the knowledge about service design together with Krishika. And we are, mm. we are a really the, the, the partner in crime and the best friend in the crew. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great to hear that. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, JJ, uh, as always, we have a lightning round with five questions that I haven't prepared you for. This is just to get to know you as a person next to the professional a little bit better. Um, just the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, th th these aren't trick questions or anything complicated. So uh, are you ready? Yes, let's do that. <laughs> okay. I try. <laughs> What's your favorite food? Oh, that's the most difficult questions. <laughs> Okay, the thing that comes to my mind is Korean barbecue. Not sure you have tried. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think so yet, uh, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll add it to my uh, to my list. What did you want to become when you were a kid? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I wanted to become a TV show producer hmm. to meet celebrities. <laughs> mm, interesting. Okay, uh, what is your hidden talent? Um, maybe synthesis, kind mm -hmm. of seeing the patterns and trying to kind of abstract into synthesis. Yeah. All right. Since I said it, it's not hidden anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's 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 purpose of this question. Uh, moving on, uh, question number four. If you could recommend one a book for us to read, which book would you recommend? Mm, to Have or To Be by Eric Fromm. <laughs> mm. I haven't yeah. read it. Add it to my uh, <laughs> reading list. And the fifth and final question, which is a tradition here on the show. Do you remember the first time you heard about service design? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think it actually touches uh, on what I already uh, kind of shared in the beginning. It was 2007, probably in February in Art University. Back then, it was called University of Art and Design Helsinki. And it was a gathering where the new PhD students gathered together and kind of introduced to each other and introduced their kind of research topic. And I, I think you can guess who that person was, but one of our peer students, Kirishika, <laughs> said, okay, my PhD study is about service design and I am uh, collaborating with um, the companies like Gone, the, the Finland-based manufacturing elevator manufacturing company and banks and Finnair, and when I heard that for the first time, I was like, um, "Wow, is there such a thing like that?" Because um, by that time, uh, I came from I have a background in human computer interaction design, so around that time, I was a bit like um, sick and bored of making the graphic user interfaces for three G mobile phones and doing all this information architecture. But the fact that um, design for services uh, was really eye-opening to me. Yeah, so that's, I think, how it kind of all began. That also shook my PhD 
project a bit. <laughs> 2007 was a great year to get into service design. I think that's also mm -hmm. around the time that I sort of first started dipping my toes into, uh, into the field and look where we are today, uh, 16 years later. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, JJ, uh, let's uh, explore our topic of today. And you summarized it uh, as service design beyond Western countries. And I think Western culture might be more appropriate even here. Uh, you had an even better uh, annotation, which I really love, is celebrating the plurality of service design. Awesome word. Um, First of all, um, I think this is super relevant and we've tried to touch upon this uh, a few times on the show, like the different flavors of service design, contextualizing it to the local cultures, uh, still mm. a lot to learn and explore here. First of all, uh, I'm really curious, um, how did you arrive at this topic? Because you studied uh, service design in Finland, now you're in Singapore. Can you take us through uh, your, your journey on how your thinking and thoughts have evolved around uh, this topic and why it is important to you. So a lot of questions, mm. but yeah, just just an introduction to set the stage maybe. Mm. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, happy to share that. Um, maybe let me start with the plurality of service design. Um, I think we all know that uh, service design itself has a very multiple plural connotations, right? And it, it itself uh, was originated from operations, management, and marketing, and it was adopted by different disciplines, including uh, inter in interaction design, industrial design, and so on and so on. And because of that, uh, it was uh, there was a kind of critical voice that service design is poorly understood, even in academia and education scene. And so for the past for the past decade, I think many service design researchers and scholars were trying to define what service design is and what service design entails. So there are like a lot of books and articles and the presentation around the definition of service design. What is service design? Anyway, why do we talk about service design when we talk about service design? But for past recent years, I've been also seeing the more and more voice that, okay, plurality of service design is actually the characteristic of service design because it's very diverse contribution areas. It can be adopted across many different sectors. So why don't we just, you know, take it as uh, one of the key characteristics of service design. So instead of trying to define service design into a single definition, uh, why don't we just reveal and share all those uh, plural faces of service design in different contexts. And then plurality of service design to me, I think uh, my pers personal interest to look at it is, has to do with the cultural context. Perhaps also it has to do with my uh, personal journey as you have mentioned. So um, I was actually, uh, I feel very thankful and lucky to learn uh, about service design and co-design in Finland because uh, as far as I believe, there's no Northern Europe. And, and also being in Finland, we were able to also interact with um, the other neighboring countries like Netherlands, Sweden, and so on. So there, the understanding of service design was quite matured. And in our project that I have done with also Kirishika, uh, we were we always positioning service design in the context of system and complex uh, collaborative network of stakeholders. So even, you know, the key deliverable of service design can be really the new collaborative network, not like any, you know, um, customer and touch point design. In the, so and negotiation, a facilitation of collaboration itself was the key deliverable of service design. So I kind of, you know, got that um, understanding of service design and came to Singapore, but in uh, came to Singapore and in Helsinki, I was also like lucky to have a chance to work with uh, various um, government organizations like City of Helsinki, Helsinki Libraries. So I've done like those projects. And I joined Singapore in 2014. And there was actually about a time uh, that a few Singapore government organizations were became interested in 
the new approaches like design thinking, service design. So they were kind of trying to try, willing to try those things. And we got connected and I was quite lucky to really have a real series of services and projects with the uh, Ministry of Manpower, Ministry of Education, IRAS, uh, the taxation office here, and um, GovTech, the government technology agencies here and so on. So then I've been kind of so I've been, you know, talking about this work to different audiences, and I am originally from Korea. And I also kind of shared my work in Singapore and also in Helsinki to South Korea. And I got to kind of uh, uh, got in touch with uh, various service designers in uh, Asian countries, like in Japan, Thailand, um, Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Korea, and so on. Then um, I've actually, like, observing and realizing there were actually similar things happening in Asian countries, like Korean governments were also trying to adopt uh, service design uh, for public service design. The same thing, a similar thing was also happening in Thailand together with UNICEF. And Japan was also trying to uh, adopt service design to uh, for their digital transformation to become a e-government. But those kind of things, right? Um, were, ne were hardly um, heard by global audience <laughs> or hardly visible by service global service design communities, perhaps due to, I don't know, language or that are not really like uh, service design uh, academy, academia people who are willing to write about it. So, so we, there are a lot of uh, the number of literature about service design in the context of public sector in journals and books but those are most of those are from the europe the states and more recently in south america and so on. but there is it's very hard to find the um, the cases and the work from asian countries so with that question i've been kind of looking around <laughs> you know what is actually happening in those organizations who are willing to and who are adopting the service design and trying to make some change in the way they work in their organizations. So I've been kind of meeting people, service design professionals and government people and trying to kind of collect the um, um, the stories and trying to the, the publish those things together in a form of a book, which we are all like working together. So, so that has been kind of one of my current work. <laughs> awesome. So you've uh, clearly seen uh, a diverse perspective of how service design is being used, applied within, uh, I'm, I'm going to generalize, uh, in the Asian context. Um, and uh, you see the success stories, you probably see the challenges. And, and that's the thing that's, I guess, interesting to explore because you've seen the Northern Europe perspective on service design and you see right now what's happening in Asia. Um, maybe we can try to explore uh, what are the moments and areas where the quote unquote Northern Europe approach breaks down or the, where you see the limitations of Ad adopting the the widespread the the, the documented uh, uh, service design approach in uh, a different culture. So again, a pretty broad question, but I'm sure you have some examples where you see service design uh, the way it's documented in the popular books in the popular literature. How is it, and where is it breaking down in uh, in Asia? Maybe not breaking down, but the way how it is adopted and understood in Asian countries. So, um, but disclaimer, you know, I'm not aiming to generalize my observations from those cases and stories that I collected, but I'm just kind of sharing the observations and phenomena that I uh, observed. So I don't think the cases that I'm sharing will be a, any, I know, stereotypical case it's anecdo or, uh, anecdotal right? yeah, anecdotal yeah. and probably well often in these conversations we use the things that are uh, have more contrast uh, to mm -hmm. sort of paint the picture and i'm sure that there are uh, definitely there are always more nuances but uh let's highlight maybe some of the more extreme examples just to uh yeah just to paint the picture here mm -hmm. okay so the keywords are two things the so service design in asian context perhaps in Korea and Singapore that I have the closest um, interaction with. Service design is understood as a codified process and a package of methods. And 
service design, the aim of a the, the most, the biggest application area of service design is services, mm -hmm. <laughs> service offerings, you know? Uh, so yeah, the, the contrast is, so, um, so in um, South Korea and in Singapore, how service design was adopted were, um, uh, it was initiated by the big organizations and big companies like DBS in Singapore and also uh, the large government organizations, the ministries in Singapore and the ministries in the Korea uh, Institute of Design Promotion in um, Korea. And because it was adopted by the management, it was quite top down. And uh, what I uh, kind of commonly um, observed in the way they adopted the service design was, so the top management, they have some resource in the beginning and they engage always this world we know, uh, the services and consultancies like engine, rework, ideal, to bring them, invite them over and organize some training in the workshops and the, the project for knowledge transfer. So that's how they do. And because it's a top-down kind of uh, uh, transfer of service design knowledge, it was, uh, the form of adopting service design was always with um, the process because they need this codified process and standardize the process and the methods because that's uh, effective for the management to penetrate that uh, practice and the knowledge within the organizations. So <clears throat> yeah, that, that's uh, quite understandable, right? It's uh, effective, and it, you know, it's uh, from the organization. They need a really the tool framework to communicate this new approach. But the side effect is um, because it was communicated into a um, um, the set of processes and methods, people believe that's the all about service design. So in the project, you know, in Korea, maybe I will share this example. In Korea, there is a the 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 government initiative called um, citizen participatory platform. It's under the um the the uh, the government ideology called or paradigm called Gov three point zero. You know, so they wanted to invite uh, the citizens to solve their own kind of social day-to-day -day problems and they facilitated this uh, project-based kind of problem-solving platform and service design was the key method uh, they kind of uh, populated as a, as a shared method to solve social problems so they partnered service designers and the citizens and the government officers and they gave all this like, handbook of service design so here is the process that you need to follow and here is the set of methods you need to take and do it's, so they have done you know series of projects i think it's a really great inspiring example and it actually the whole project actually awarded um, IF Service Design Golden Award because it was great initiative, you know, the agenda was great. But the, again, the side effect was, um, so people started to believe, okay, if we follow this double diamond process, and if we, uh, if we uh, conducted customer journey mapping, if we developed persona, it's a service design project. We did a service design, it's a service design. So they didn't really, um, care to really delve into the, the actual mindsets, the actual services and capabilities, or the system level uh, contribution that service design can make were not really uh, looked. So that's a, so that's, yeah, that's a one kind of uh, way of adopting service design in Asian context from the top down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, what I'm hearing, and um, I I see this happening, I think in a broader context as well, but it's it's sort of the the recipe approach to service design, the cookbook approach to service design. Here are your ingredients, your tools and methods, your journey maps and personas. Here is the process. Uh, if you follow this, then you'll have a delicious meal, right? That's that's sort of the analogy that I'm hearing you share. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Uh... It's uh yeah so I don't think it's necessarily bad bad bad. <laughs> it's effective, you know. It's effective for penetrate, like, um, make people known. But um, the if the real capabilities and the real contribution areas are left behind, they haven't really utilized the full potential of service design. That's a kind of you know 
the sad part. <laughs> I have some ideas, but I'm curious to hear from you. Like, um, what what did you see was missing, or like what? Um, how did their challenges and projects again i don't know if this is the right word but suffer like uh, something apparently wasn't um they weren't using the full potential of service design and why was it like mm. okay uh so for example um okay if we I, I don't have a really concrete example in my mind at the moment but um uh, i said uh in um the, the project that I was um, working on Finland, the more than uh, rare times, the key deliverable itself is the creation of the stakeholder network, the creation or a clarification of the new collaborative network. So those like stakeholder mapping and also the kind of our annotation or the um, the findings on their mindset change or the way uh, they perceive uh, each uh, stakeholder that itself was uh, quite a the outcome but in the context of singapore and the uh, uh the korea again I'm, I, I'm i think i'm generalizing a bit but um <laughs> but um they value applied project so the service design project there should be always the end like the design the things that need to be taken and applied instead of the sort of fundamental value cooperation network you know so i am sure in those service and project you know those people might have those people for example in that um the citizen participate platform those people have met different you know stakeholders and kind of they really try to uh, organized there, there must be really significant situated work that they did try to build rapport and try to get their buy-in and try to uh, uh, build trust but those are all kind of you know the trust building among um, stakeholders and all the new relationships among different stakeholders were kind of not really articulated and left behind but so here are our ideas. This is customer journey map. So this is how it can be implemented. But all those um, beautiful, significant work, situated work for trust building or network building have been kind of really left behind. Mm. I think that that's really the 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 contribution or the role that services and can play that UX design and interaction design cannot do. And this is um, again. I'm really curious if this is if you feel that this is unique to Asia, uh, but uh, it's sort of it feels like the byproducts of service design, which aren't the byproducts. They are actually the main deliverable, and that these are the trust, credibility, relationships, new networks, um, uh, rather than the actual deliverables, uh, as we know. <clears throat> Does this have to do with uh, a lack of? design maturity a lack of understanding of design in general does this have to do with culture uh, what is your take on this mm, yeah definitely design maturity and design maturity has to do with um, the organizational culture and perhaps the social um national <laughs> culture and um in um so the Asian countries, like those um, some of the countries that I mentioned, I think the understanding of service, uh, understanding of design is still creating things, you know, creating physical or um, digital <laughs> things. So there should be something, you know. So it's a by by. So the, it's the where to prioritize as the main deliverable and byproduct you know so in asian context those design the things you know the digital physical things or the new customer journeys are always the um the main it, it, it's under the spotlight you know whereas those um collaborative network and new relationships that enable <laughs> those new design things are kind of in the background you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, uh, it, it's not really uh, perceived as a the legitimate outcomes of design project. Whereas in Europe, uh, they have this maturity understand, okay, this is actually very hard to achieve, you know, the collaborative, collaborative network, negotiation and facilitation of the collaboration. 
that's a really hard to achieve. And that's what design can actually um, um, make happen. So the mm. maturity uh, makes a difference. Uh, do you feel that this is uh, unique to Asia or that Asia is more prone to this than, I don't know, what you've experienced in, uh, in Europe? Yeah, I think it's not really uh, unique to Asia. Well, within Asia, there are many countries <laughs> and within country, there are many you know, organizations and the cities, the same for Europe, you know, so I don't want to really, you know, make this dichotomy between Asia, Europe or Western and Eastern. But um, but those things are really ob observed, uh, like based on my experiences and, and um, I sometimes get to feel jealous when I kind of uh, encounter those very system level services and projects from UK, <laughs> like all these healthcare service network project or in you know, the Sweden, Norway, like why this kind of similar project cannot be really happening in Singapore and uh, the mm. Korea. You know, do we, we don't have enough maturity. We don't have enough resource or patience mm. <laughs> to make that happen <laughs> or we don't have expertise to make that happen i think um, it's good to uh, also recognize that the the successful projects or the the systemic projects uh the examples of service design still in europe and even in america are are a handful and uh we are getting better but i uh, i get the opportunity to speak to a lot of practitioners uh, both here on the show and outside of the show and it's still a struggle i think for for many of us to actually get to that uh higher level of design maturity so maybe mm -hmm. i don't know maybe it's it's not um uh all that great there are there are a handful of leaders and icons and uh uh, companies that we can sort of get inspiration from, but a lot of us are, are still uh, trying to catch up. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that way? Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I know for a fact that, the, that that's the case. Mm. Uh, again, yeah. all the practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, like we have, you know, like some conversations uh, between the um, services and professionals and the researchers. Okay. Then what would be the future of a service design? And um, and kind of trends of service design research nowadays is really the system level, you know, like like uh, those that uh, the service design researcher like Joshina Finks is really promoting, you know, systemic level service design or institutional level service design or uh, organization of simulation through service design. So there are we have a lot of theories, frameworks, and so on. But if we want to find the actual empirical cases around the world, empirical successful cases, it's actually not easy to find, not just in Asia. So um, yeah, yeah, how, yeah. How, how can you make that theory happen? So it yeah. was a big yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think a lot of practitioners are still trying to get their organizations from maturity level one to maturity level two. Uh, and everybody is... Um, uh, is in the in the same journey. I'm I'm curious uh, from your perspective. So uh, we we know that um, some companies are adopting initially service design as a recipe. I think everybody mm -hmm. starts out that way. What does this mean for us as professionals? Do we need to change our language? Do we need to change our tools? Do we need to change anything? Is it like it's just the way it is. It's a process and it just takes time. How do you think about this? Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's a that's a great, great question. And I'm still exploring. So I don't really have the really clear answer to that. But like um um like we've I we've been discussing with also like the, the other service designers who share similar thoughts. Maybe we, we we should not talk about service design through the di double diamond process or the methods, or even nowadays these lean methodologies combined with the double diamond process. But we just you know let employees who are in that kind of training program or let service designers just talk about like story tell what they did and what are their 
really the actions and what are their findings and what are their kind of really strategic work and effort. So we need to really um, make that sort of a venues for them to really talk about those um, the stories and narratives. Um, yeah, that's one thing. And also um, another kind of the, the attempt that I kind of was doing was um, um, uh, because of um, this um, all this um, process and the method oriented uh, service design training or interchangeably design thinking training in the context of service organizations like government or healthcare. So um, uh, 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 those people who come to those training actually have different maturity like individually also they they have different maturity and different perceptions and different understanding of the design the role of design the role of uh, user involvement and the, the ability for framing and so on and so on so with um, one of the ministries that i collaborated with uh several years ago what we tried was um to calibrate the sort of a different understandings or the, to calibrate their employees' misalignment in understandings of design contributions and design roles, we developed a design capability mapping tool in the context of government officers. So we kind of um, categorized uh, the items into four categori categories, like the, how they understand users, how they understand design practices, how they understand implementation, how they experience organizational structure and resources. So we kind of listed questions and kind of gave a kind of multiple choice options and let those um, the government officers to map their understanding how they perceive the role of users and how they perceive the contribution areas or the, or the capability of design in that tool before um, they participate in the any like design thinking or service designing training um, program so that they know what they know and they don't know what they know. So that's sort of a build a kind of learning objectives. And they also kind of share and recognize their different understandings about the design roles before joining the, the sort of um, process-based um, service designing training programs. Yeah, and I can imagine, uh, I'm curious if the tool is uh, available somewhere, but I can imagine that it helps the design professional to understand with what kind of audience they're dealing and sort of uh, what expectations they have and if you need to realign and uh, adjust some of these expectations. Uh, is this tool available somewhere or is it an internal tool? Uh, it's uh, it will be available. We were publishing it, and we are also like preparing it, it to be a Creative Commons open source. Nice. Thing. Yeah, the, <laughs> we the just didn't put it yeah. out there yet. <laughs> the other thing uh, that I couldn't agree more with you, and I think I recorded a video about this uh, over four years ago, that the Dommel Diamond has served its purpose, and it's really time to move on for us. Uh, what the double diamond does is it sets the expectation of a very process and a linear oriented way of working. It's very efficiency oriented and it's very, uh, it, uh, it gives the notion that you can sort of manage this process. And I don't think, and we know as, as a community that that's not the case. I think the language we need, we need to move into a language around that's more derived from theater, uh, we have many other more useful metaphors uh, that can serve as a way better uh, way of setting expectations around what service design is. As, uh, one thing, it's not it's not a linear process that the Dommel Diamond has sort of been misused um, to show. It's much rather like, an, again, uh, playing a, 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 a sports game together, creating a theater piece together. That's much more of the dynamic. And I think we are not adopting and sharing that kind of language around service design enough. Uh, we need to let like let's stop the double diamond. There there are use cases for it, but if you're thinking about using the double diamond, you can probably use something that's much better to explain your story. How we, how do you feel about this? 
I love that idea, <laughs> you know, with these old theatrical metaphors and theatrical terms. And like, because I also teach service then to the students, you know, instead of showing, okay, this is like basically the process that you are going to follow over the semester. But, you know, how, how can, maybe we can introduce that sort of um, improvisation and kind of really, really like the, 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 the reciprocal kind of, you know, given. <laughs> take kind of relationship that that is an awesome idea <laughs> yeah I, again i think we have much better stories and there have been some episodes here on the show which help you to set a much better expectation around what this actually is and again it's not a linear process there is linearity there's definitely progression in design but it's not the progression that um uh, we tend to advocate with the double diamond and uh, yeah, it, it, we do everybody a big favor if we move away from that language and adopt uh, uh, other examples. Um, I'm curious, uh, what do you feel needs to happen next? So we, are, we know that uh, this is the case. We know that there are better ways of explaining sharing service design. Um, what are you working on right now? And what do you feel that that needs to happen as, to evolve our practice, to evolve our community from where we are today? Mm. Mm. So as an immediate thing that I'm working on is really make those non-Western stories feasible <laughs> and create a service design research and a professional network in the context of Asia. Because um, you know, we there are the service design have been really growing for the past decade a lot, and there are really networks in the communities, but they are um, all kind of Western based. So ca can we maybe form equivalent communities and networks so that those communities from different parts of the world can learn from each other? So that really making establishing that the channels and platforms for those Asian countries uh, to be heard. So that's the immediate thing that I kind of am trying to work on by collaborating with the different actors here. Yeah. And if somebody is listening to our conversation right now and they are from Asia, uh, is there already something that they can join, that they can participate in? Um, how, how far are you with setting up these channels and these networks? Mm. Yeah, not really. Yeah, it's a. It's, I, I still see the wrong way to go. The first thing is, um, uh, so like as as a kind of small, um, starting point, I've been organizing kind of a symposium with um, uh, the uh, service and professionals and uh, researchers from Asian countries. We actually had one in February. And we will be publishing like those discussions in different formats, and that's one. And I think that in Taiwan, actually, they are actually doing very interesting things as well. And they, I think, they are also trying to build a service design professional network um, in the context of Asia. So I think that's kind of cooking, something cooking there. And they're also doing the podcasts <laughs> by inviting like service design uh, designers and service design professionals and researchers in Asian countries to talk about their work. So those kind of, you know, movements are um, observed, but it's a still kind of scattered. Mm -hmm. So maybe <laughs> I'm just kind of following my um <laughs> the the thought flow but we need a uh, funding we need a resource one of the success factors for european networks to be successful and to grow is they have this big eu and uh, <laughs> the funding that can support like five year long project that allow researchers to really delve into the fundamentals about this service design as a knowledge, service design as a discipline. And they have this uh, really the pretend that it kind of build, builds a platform for services and researchers to really look at the system, look at the future scenario and so on and so on. But uh, look, due to the, this economic context of Asian countries, the funding mechanism, I think they are not really ready to support such project. You know, so yeah. yeah, those kind of funding 
I hope <laughs> we can have and, so yeah. that yeah. And and I guess what uh what we quote unquote in Europe already have is like an established educational and uh literature base for service design you can actually point to research point to articles like it's uh um it's established you, you, it's scientifically researched and that helps to uh leverage its credibility to to sort of demonstrate it to organizations and uh what i'm hearing you say that's not yet the case for asia people are doing service design but there isn't there isn't much literature you can point to and say here are the examples we have uh, in our region that show that service design is being practiced how it's being practiced what the outcomes are and every, we, you still sort of need to borrow all the examples that aren't maybe relevant or applicable to your region mm, yes yes yeah very right to say so yeah and um especially in europe the network is very strong the cross-country network because of the EU, perhaps, you know, but we don't have such a, we have this Asia Pacific kind of, <laughs> you know, the, but it's, uh, it's not really um, um, like this as the U European EU research network. So how can you promote that cross-country uh, network? But that's, I think, the Asian services and scholars and researchers and professionals really need to maybe work on. <laughs> hmm. What do you wish, uh, now that you've gone through this whole journey and you're still in the middle of it, what do you wish you maybe had known five years ago about this process? Not, maybe not known, but um, maybe maybe not the kind of knowledge, but um, maybe attitude. <laughs> uh, I think I was kind of... Um, receptive to the way the government organization uh, like my counterparts my clients my collaborators from the government i kind of uh, try to adapt my deliverables in the way they desired i wanted to make them happy <laughs> but um yeah but but um I've, I've been thinking, I've been reflecting, maybe I should have really pushed, you know, because if I really wanted to promote the system level contribution of service design, you know, so as an educator, as a service design scholar, maybe I should be the one who really needed to introduce these possible cases and you can actually do something different than, you know, what you have asked for me, you know, so I should have more, uh, like courageous and the pushing yeah so if i do the project again with those government organizations i will be more challenging <laughs> and courageous. That's, yeah yeah good that you sort of address this because that's sort of so hard when you uh, you you're, you weren't starting out before if somebody's listening and they are just starting out like um uh, setting the bar and sort of being demanding uh from your clients to live up to a certain standard because you know that eventually they will benefit from it um but you have to you have to challenge them like if you're not entirely certain about your own skills and expertise then it's really hard to do because you first need those five years to sort of do the projects fail and then realize okay i really know what i'm doing what i'm saying and now i can challenge the clients like that's that's the ultimate secret don't wait five years like already trust what you know uh and don't compromise on quality uh, live up to the standards and um yeah you don't have to wait five years already be be i don't know if demanding is is the right word but uh yeah courageous and, and, and challenge your clients rather than um catering to their short-term needs that's right yeah mm. <laughs> that's right what do you hope is the one thing somebody will take away from our conversation if they think back about our conversation one year from now what is the one thing you hope that they will at least remember can i say two things <laughs> sure <laughs> of course <laughs> okay so um so as i as we have discussed um so um, um we haven't really utilized full potential of a service design which can actually 
uh, transform the collaborative network, transform the business structure. So we need to really try to build more and more uh, cases that can really showcase the full potential of service design. That way, service design can actually make bigger contribution and can be can have more longevity you know, instead of just sitting behind or becoming like a fad you know, at one point of the history. So that's one thing. I actually forgot the second thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> so Asian audience, <laughs> the service design researchers, service design professionals, um, um, let's collaborate, you know, <laughs> let's build network. Let's share our cases and the failure cases and success cases. I know so I, I, I don't, I don't mean that I am leading this. I know there are a lot of people out there like under our so like service design chapter, service design that talk chapters in different uh, Asian countries. But I think we can also really, you know, gel our efforts together and make into something big. Yeah. Let's collaborate. I think that's a great uh, call to action. Um, <laughs> just uh, again, if somebody is already listening from Asia uh, to this, uh, I host a network for service design professionals who are in-house. We have a community which is focused on sort of the the Asia Pacific time zone. Um, there are already many professionals in there. We meet on a regular basis. So. Um, now, mostly people from Australia and Europe there right now, mm -hmm. but I would love it if we get some people from Singapore, some people from, again, and the, all the regions. So th that network is already here. If you're in-house service design professional and you'd like to have conversations with other in-house service design professionals, uh, join uh, the circle. I'll make sure that the link is, is there, but uh, I would also encourage everybody to reach out to you and see what other options there are to and become part of a, of a bigger community, I guess. That sounds fantastic. Yes, we need to like, yeah, promote it more and more, yes. Awesome. JJ, thank you so much for coming on, uh, sharing your perspective a bit and uh, sharing sort of the stories, the challenges and the ambitions that lie uh, ahead. I really hope to have more guests uh, from uh, Asia on the show in the coming uh, weeks, months and years ahead. So uh, I'll definitely do my best to, to uh, create a stage uh, to share those stories as well. Uh, once again, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much. <laughs> I hope that this conversation got your mind going about where, how and why we all need to be working hard to make service design better fit the culture around us, whether that's the culture of your country or that of your company. I want to give a huge thanks to JJ for coming on the show and sharing her perspective with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking that like button. It lets me know whether or not we're on the right track by addressing topics like this. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for spending a small part of your day with me. It was an absolute pleasure and honor. Please keep making a positive impact and I'll catch you very soon in the next video.